Because I think there's a lot of ways in which um, we're all really familiar with these beliefs, values, assumptions, but we're not always aware of the fact that that's what they are. Sometimes we just kind of take them for granted as like the way that it is. So we wanted to spend some time looking at the way that we think about work and what are other ways of, of thinking about that as we move forward. Um, you know, right now we live in a, in a society where um, a lot of stuff we kind of like feed through the lens of capitalism, whether we're aware of it or not. And so that factors into the way we think about work because at the end of the day, um, we don't always necessarily think about um, the inherent meaning of something. It's just kind of like, well, if you can find a buyer and you can find a seller, like it's a good, you know, like that makes sense. Like that's a, a valid transaction, but it doesn't always have this kind of interior sense of like, is this something we should be buying and selling? Like are these things that are, are out for consumption? Um, in a capacity, and I think that you know we kind of look at this economic model as as something um, that we factor a lot of other things through too. So when we talk about getting a job, when we talk about working, we think about responsibility, we think about success, we think about career, we think about validation. But a lot of that comes in terms of like output as well. Like what are you um, producing? And the question is, you know, the way that we measure that a lot of times is in terms of efficiency or is in terms of like the product or is in terms of um, some sort of financial incentive. But what would it mean if we held something else as the bottom line um, next to or maybe even on top of, of those values of like orienting everything through the lens of is this productive, is this efficient? What if we talked about the way in which, you know, how does this um, produce goods for the worker? How does this benefit society? Is this socially responsible? Is this sustainable? then we might start looking at a system of economy that runs in a really different way because we're asking different questions and we're gearing ourselves towards a different set of outputs. Um, so we want to start looking at and, and analyzing that a little bit, especially as folks who are part of a college campus because, um, you know, when, when talking in class about like what do you want to be when you grow up, we go see the Career Center. Um, and I think that that's something we also want to look at the way that we understand career in society. Um, a lot of times we kind of bracketed out, um, you know, career and profession on, to represent something that is, is good, that gives us status, um, that is socially acceptable, it's like a, you know, a sign of whether we've made it. But when we talk about career and profession, oftentimes we're, what we're actually doing is looking at a type of work that is, um, you know, it comes with a certain, like a degree, um, like a bachelor's degree or like a college degree, and all of a sudden it's a type of, we're bracketing it out in a different way. It's not universally accessible at that point. It's a very particular thing. It has to do more with kind of like the intellectual work we do instead of the production of a concrete thing. Um, and it's validated in a way that has socioeconomic um, and privilege ramifications, and so it's not something, career is not necessarily something that we use as a term accessible to everybody. It's something that we use as a term um, accessible to, to a certain group and a, and a privileged group. And then we, when we look at labor, um, labor also has relationships to socioeconomic status because we think of it in terms of like, um, things that we do with our hands, but in some ways we see that as like a divide um, in the way that we look at kind of our, our economic and professional model. There's like your career and then there's work. Um, and one is more valued and one is um, not valued with the same set of prestige sometimes from, from a social um, view. And so also recognizing the socioeconomic implications that undergird that, like is that something that we want to affirm? Is that the way that we want to look at things? Or is there another way of looking at work and creation and labor that asks questions of um, relationship to what it is that we're producing, is that something that we should value um, instead of just being distanced, like should we know what it is that we're creating and what it is that we're consuming and what it is that we're kind of participating in. So it raises questions of, um, you know, relationship, it raises questions of <laughs> consumption, it raises questions of creativity. Is work merely something we do to drive the economy or is there a way of looking at the economy in terms of is this something that um, increases our, our fullness as individuals and as a community and what is the creative aspect of what we do because you know the reality is for most of us we're going to spend most of our lives 
working in some capacity um, for our livelihood and does that necessarily have to be something that is just um, kind of like in exchange or, or survival mentality or is that something that can be creative and constructive and something that isn't something we do so that we can live our life in another sphere? How do we think of that as like the, the good part of living our life and kind of redefine our understanding of, of work and, and career and profession and economy around that? So those are some of the questions we want to be looking at today. And just to draw in a little bit the idea of how this is connected to our servant leadership themes that run throughout, um, this third meeting is always focused on a little bit more of an ambiguous topic, but very important nonetheless, and that is a true servant leader is also a seeker first, right? They're always looking for that leader, that prophet, that idea that's a mean to healing and flourishing. Through their whole lives, they're asking that question, they're looking, they're actively engaged in that seeking and that search. And so sometimes, not necessarily applicable today, we also slash, you know, seeker slash first follower. Because that means that a servant leader is not necessarily somebody who is always just the starting point, the leader, the founder, you name it. Servant leaders also look at potentially the, to get behind a movement or a person who has a great idea, a prophet whose ideas are a means of healing. To be a first follower changes some random person into a leader, and a movement begins when a follower actually decides to follow. So a lot of what's incumbent in our own culture, and especially on campus, is we always have to strive as the leader. But a true servant leader is going to look at the end goal first, and in that seeking, recognize the opportunities, much like maybe the disciples even, when that prophet comes across their path, or that, that moment, that opportunity that speaks to their heart, They've done the homework in their seeking to know to take that leap and take the next step. So in terms of my personal life in some way, playing off a little bit of Jenna's um, examples of what we always get asked in our lives, what do you want to be when you grow up? Which I think is really interesting when you break down the words there because we automatically assume it's what do you want to do, right? And I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, right? I wanted, actually came to Villanova when I was an undergrad for astronomy because I was thought I'd maybe want to be an astronaut someday, and you know, I had a lot of different ideas. But in high school, I couldn't answer that question. But I, did, I could answer this question a little bit better. I know who I wanted to be. And I had mentors and people in my life that I admired, and I knew regardless of what it was that I was going to do, I wanted to be more like them. And so my path started out by looking at the communities, the peoples, the individuals that I admired and that spoke to my heart um, about my, you know, who I truly am and want to be, and I looked at the path they trod. And I, that's how I began looking down that road. So today, uh, in looking at the ideas of work in which Jenna brought forth, we really wanted to have some speakers that kind of bring out the contrast and some alternatives to that, and also, um, Mark and Mary are old friends. Uh, we met in grad school, and I was just explaining to this now, them to this now. We haven't seen each other in about 10 years because life kind of separates you, um, and we were reunited recently. But their life path, even back then, had a strong influence on my own. Um, from the choice to leave grad school at the time I did and take a certain job, to witnessing their family life and deciding I was more called to a family life as they were living it. Because what I truly admired, and uh, try not to make them blush right now, is they made very difficult yet intentional choices about the, the way they were going to move forward with their lives and not necessarily do the easy thing or the default thing or the conventionally societally sanctioned thing. But they were much more involved in a process of discernment as to how, and they had two little daughters at the time and a, another young one on the way, right, Will, right? Not till later, okay, I met him later, that's what it was. Leo, I did meet Leo in Copake, I met Leo, that's what it was. Anyway, not, neither here nor there for you guys. Um, we're still catching up. But I, we're, we're, we'll just turn it over and they'll talk a little bit about their journey and their path. So I want you guys to, you'll probably hear themes that Jenna was talking about in, in, in uh, 
uh, bringing them up, but also want you to think about questions yourselves that you may have for them afterwards, because they are a tremendous witness and a tremendous resource um, for our own discernment moving forward. So with that, uh, you guys now you want to pass it over? Stick it on my lap. I don't need to play. Just clip it. So I'm Mary, and um, my husband Mark. So um, I wanted to start today. It's just it's great to look around the circle, and I don't think Mark and I get too much time with uh, your your um, age group. So it's it's really great to see some young faces and enthusiastic young faces. Actually, that's not really true. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> we, as you'll see, we work with folks that are between 18 and 25, which are your age, except we work with folks with disabilities and, um, and actually just post-grad people that um, are co-workers with us. Anyway, what I wanted to do today was just start with a poem by Hafiz, who's a 14th century Persian poet. and. Um, what I want to leave you with today is, aside from our story, you're all going to follow your own destiny and your own path. And that the journey, the one thing I want to, at least that you grasp when you leave today, is that the journey is all about relationship. No matter what your work is, no matter what your, um, what you encounter in your life, it will always come back to relationship and it's not even, it's all of us because we are all connected, but the relationship with yourself and your authentic self and your relationship with God. So this um, poem by Hafiz is called Absolutely Clear. Don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut more deep. Let it ferment and season you as few human or even divine ingredients can. Something missing in my heart tonight has made my eyes so soft, my voice so tender, my need of God absolutely clear. I was fortunate enough when I was um, mid-twenties to pretty much run right into Mark. Um, I, when I met him, I, real, I, I knew that I was going to marry him and be with him for the rest of my life, um, this particular life. And we met while we were doing Jesuit Volunteer Corps, actually I was working for them, and he had just applied as a, a volunteer. That's another kind of story. But um, JVC, Jesuit Volunteer Corps, uh, we can't speak highly enough of them as an organization, is built on four values of community, simplicity, simple, uh, social justice, and something else. No, like hospitality, community. Right. Yeah. Um, and those four values are really, they're so ingrained in our life, and, and we must have just taken them so seriously, or they really fed into who we are as people, that, that we have um, set our life course to always take those into account for no matter what we do. And, and um, their slogan is ruin for life, and it's true. I mean, that in the world standards, I suppose, that... Um, Mark and I have, um, I, I mean, some would say that we have chosen an un unambitious path, but um, yeah, I don't think we, we ever regret or um, look back on our choices as anything but profoundly um, significant and um, ha have created who we are and what our family is today. So um, I wanted to just just um, cut, what, 16 years later, um, this is our 17th year of marriage, we have been working for the last decades, uh, really after we um, left Notre Dame, we went 
into community, intentional community, with an organization called Camp Hill. And Camp Hill is an um, uh, international organization of folks that work with people with disability, live in community, and share um, our everyday life and all of our resources together to, to build community and to, um, and to really strive to make subtle but significant change in the world. And um, the work that we chose with them, I, I am trained as a social worker and I have also a master's in theology, but when, when we went into Camp Hill, all of those titles were, were really taken from us or we relinquished them. Um, we took, we were given a very large house um, with, how it must have been 12 bedrooms. We lived with five folks with disabilities. Um, we had our two children then, and I was pregnant with our third. And we had two young co-workers that joined us from, um, at that point, I think one was from the States and one was from Germany. And I was given the role as householder, and Mark was kind of my um, partner in that. But he was given, at that point, gosh, I think they asked him to make cheese. You know, we had, it was a big farm, 800 acre farm, um, lots of beautiful organic gardens, biodynamic gardens, as well as an enormous, you know, we must have had 20 head uh, of milking cows and all kinds of other animals and uh, all kinds of workshops, a weavery, a bakery, a candle making shop, um, et cetera. And so we spent, Eight years there, um, Mark at one point was asked then to open the bakery and to take over the bakery. And while he had a love of baking, um, just from his own personal experience, he was not trained. And I'll let him talk about that. Um, but what I wanted to point at then was that my every day was pretty much unpredictable. I was running a, pr a, a rhythmic, very rhythmic home where there was a schedule that was followed um, with the intention of a therapeutic environment. Um, but it was a home life that we created that anything could happen at any time. And if I was not at my best and um, as upright as I could be in my attitude, in my, um, in my approach, in my words, in my lack of words and my, um, my composure, then the day could quickly spiral. And I learned, um, I, think mo I think firmly in Camp Hill, not during my time um, at JVC or in my work at Catholic Charities or in all my things before Camp Hill, the importance of, of quiet time with myself. And, and for me, that's meditation. And uh, if it's five minutes, if it's, if it's a great 30 minutes, it is a complete, quiet, tranquil, usually very early in the morning. And when I do start my day like that or end my day like that, um, I find that I am that much more grounded. And I, and I want to go back to Hafiz because if I am not authentically in love with myself and my spirit and what I, I know to be um, unique and, and significant in my gifts. And, and if I am not connected to the spirit of the divine, then things quickly disconnect for all of my relationships with everyone around me that is human or not human, any of the, uh, of the material world even. Um, yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that and um, pass it on to Mark when you want to be clicked. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm excited to talk to you. The many things come to my mind. I'll, I'll continue with the Camp Hill talk uh, what was left out a little bit was that it was a it's an it just uh, Rudolf Steiner is a philosopher an Austrian philosopher that developed 
pretty esoteric philosophy that when used can create all kinds of interesting ways to approach the world from agriculture to medicine to Camp Hill, which is which was created by Carl Koenig, who was an anthroposophist, this quick little history of it. An anthroposophist is someone who follows the teachings of Rudolf Steiner. And what's important about this is through observation, Carl Koenig saw a group of people that weren't able to thrive in the world. And at the time, it was children that had special needs. And so, this is the type of thinking of that, Nazi and this was in Nazi Germany, and he was, he was Jewish? Yeah, so this, it's an incredible story to look up, so the, the history of Camp Hill is worth getting into just to see how amazing its development is. So this <coughs> impulse of looking to seeing, you know, how can I be in the world in a way to, to help people to create something that we can thrive in and to include people that would be on the margins. So we could spread that out to lots of different margins, right? But this is focused on special needs, um, is the impulse that carries through. So even when Mary's talking about our home life, here we are, quote, normal people with a family, and we are living with five people with special needs in a mutual way. We're not hired. See, one of our biggest pet peeves is the parents of these folks that we lived with might call and kind of treat us like employees. It's like, whatever. I like to <laughs> live with this guy. I'm going to, you know, if he's not helping me do the dishes when I'm doing the dishes, I'm going to be like, what's going on? We like, we're living in community together. We're not working for them. And that's a really interesting thing as a social worker or as somebody that might think, I want to contribute to the world by helping the poor. As soon as you separate into them, it's just not quite right. And yet, you can't help it sometimes. I mean, we work with folks that we have to label. I mean, it's so radical, you know, disability that it's like I need to know if it's autism and then I can learn some things, right? And at the same time, that ruins it. And so, I'll jump to my topic that I've come here to talk about is work within this Camp Hill movement. And uh, so, we'll come back to the Camp Hill impulse stuff. And I want to answer the question, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up, too? <laughs> and uh, as I went through uh, my life, you know, I had all my, that, 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 the question just, changes as you go, as you keep going through life. And uh, at this point, I can say, it's not, maybe it's not a choice, except the choice to like listen to your heart, you know, if, if there's destiny involved, or you know, we can get into that kind of thinking if we want to, but it's, it is like, when's your heart going to speak to you and let you know this is it? And uh, really only a lucky person can find that. Or maybe you, it can take many years. And so I tried being a teacher. I've been a drug and alcohol counselor. And uh, I attempted to be a philosopher for a while. <laughs> and then it happened at this Camp Hill, which you heard where I, I joined a community where I just, I'm open to just kind of helping out. And where can I go? I made cheese for a while and took care of cows. And I loved it, right? And then the baker left, and I go in the bakery just because I liked food, and there was this bakery, and they needed someone to work with 10 people with special needs, like all kinds of different needs. And uh, I said yes to that and found myself researching how to bake bread. I'm moving up to my vocational moment here. I went to California <laughs> to, to follow some bakers that I admired, and, and that's where it happened, in a personal experience of work, that there was a wood-fired oven in the middle of the night that I knew in the next day we were going to bake hundreds of loaves. And the wood-fired oven was 800 degrees, so it's super powerful brick. It's like 10 tons, and it was quiet, like just... <laughs> It gives me chills. It gives me chills just thinking about it. Because I knew, I knew. I was like, 
I, if I die when I'm loading this dragon, this fire-eating dragon, like I can do this till I'm 90. And so all that, you know, does it make money? I, I hadn't thought about that. You know, and I just knew that, like, that's what I do. And it's working with the four elements. And you do that every day. And it's the kind of a grind work. I mean, you're carrying 50-pound bags. I threw my back out really bad once. And, and yet that, I had a connection with an archetype. You know, this is ancient, right? A baker. Plato's perfect world and these words and themes are up in the, in the perfect world or the heavens. And they exist. And... And when you come across a saying a baker, it like exists somewhere perfectly. And once your heart is in tuned with that, it, it could be a farmer, a candlestick maker, it could be a teacher. It goes on and on, right? And that's when we say, what do you want to be? There's these archetypes out there speaking to your heart and you got to learn how to listen to it. And so once you have that, it's super exciting, right? And so I began this path and whether I'm good or not, it doesn't even matter. I'm like kind of addicted to it. And I still, today, baked off a bunch of loaves in a wood-fired oven, which is a total pain in the ass to work. <laughs> and I open the door to see if the loaves busted open with their crust, and I do that every day. And I always, it's like Christmas every time I open the door. So the point of sharing that with the topic that was presented is, can you know, somebody with Downs, autism, can anybody that live on the margins they're not allowed in our society. Can they have that experience like I had? That's what I meant by lucky. Let alone, can you guys, who you know, seem like pretty capable, strong people, you know, you'll find your thing someday. And, but what about these other people? And so this was what Camp Hill taught me. Because I just kind of got, I was open to it. And so I began working with people with special needs. So here I'll critique myself real quick, and that is, you know, ability is a continuum. Disability doesn't exist. I mean, everybody has ability, but, you know, it's just too easy to say they have disabilities or special needs, and so you have to erase that real quick. And uh, what Camp Hill teaches, and that includes in the household when you're living and working with people, and they use a term called social therapy, but not therapy in the conventional sense. Social therapy, my, my favorite, it means mutuality, really, and that we're equal. And the, the best term is magic reciprocity is my favorite term for how to work with people on the margins. Magic reciprocity, because how it works, I, I guess I don't know, and that's why you say magic. Because I work with some people that are very unpredictable, and uh, it's just full of laughs, and it's full of frustrations, because I'm taking my craft seriously. And I, I, work, I have a professional bakery, and I got, I got people, some people don't walk, some people have all kinds of interesting needs that they need to talk about during the day. <laughs> and uh, I was working with Christina this morning. She was loading the baguettes. She has her white chef's jackets on. And she loads the baguettes on a board, and she brings it to me to put on the peel, and then I put it in the oven. We get this thing going for like an hour straight, right? And, you know, try to picture that because this is a Downs woman that is totally a baker. Like, she's in touch with the archetype. She loves food and coffee especially, but she will, and you'd have to know her, but for her to put down her coffee to go, like, say, do the dishes or, like, go to a meeting is like you'd have to drag her out of the house. But when I say it's time to load the oven with baguettes, she brings the coffee with her and puts it like right next to the oven and we start working. She is having work that is contributing to the world. And it's cool work. I mean, once you're in crafts and you're doing, you know, working with natural things, we're not just like putting um, toothpaste caps on bottles or, you know, and it's not to put down that type of work that can help people find something to do to, and even make a little money. But who gets to really connect with an archetype? And so, anyways, after Christina helped load all those baguettes, you know, she, 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 without being told, she swept up then the table, she cleaned up the floor, 
And uh, we're getting ready for the next round of bread to come through, and she's dustpanning the floor, and she's, dust, she's kind of a cute, round lady. And she's going like this, and she just stops. And she won't move until I go behind her and look through her legs. Like, there's a bunch of people in the baker, too. It's a retail. I have to look down, and, and it's like, come on. And she just starts laughing because she's looking through her legs. But she wasn't going to move till I said hi to her between her legs. And then we could, so this is some of the, un, this is the kind of work as well that brings joy and brings me down to earth, right? I'm cranking out stuff for these customers coming in, and I can get caught up and we have to sell this, make this, and I get brought down to earth by these simple little diverse experiences. And so anyway, that's kind of an example of my day. None of us are making any money. You know, Mary and I both in that situation, we're not making a salary, we live in community. And you might ask, have questions about that later. But uh, you know, some of the challenge that I face now is, yeah, why, can Christina get a salary? You know, it's, it, it gets complicated to go into this, but that's kind of my dream is to make a professional bake. We're a nonprofit, and so we get subsidized a bit. But how can, what, what I want is people come into this bakery now and uh, know they're in a professional bakery and they don't say this is a chair. It's not a charity. You know, you, you come in and we're trying to make artisan bread there. You know, and, Chris, and then they look back and see, Robin, who's on two crutches, and his, he has a wild story from Vietnam stuff, and he, he's a real baker, just like I just mentioned. And they notice, oh, did he help make all this stuff? And then it kind of creeps up on people. So it's indirectly showing the public that we we're working with people on the margins. But I don't, we don't advertise that. But can we make it in the world? It, you know, anyway, that, that topic is, is interesting. How to go about this healing process of you know, economic pursuit and so forth is interesting. Anyway, did I have something else on my... You get up on your sheet. I think I'm almost ready to open it for oh, no, questions. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'll stop there. I mean, that's the description of the work, an introduction to Camp Hill, and definitely want to leave some time for any questions. There's lots of stuff that, that could be said, but. Um, how do you balance, like, your work and your family life? And, like, the idea, like, if you're not taking in the salary and then, like, you know, choosing schools, and, like, like, that kind of thing, like, the balance. Yeah, well that's, so this is our, um, this is our 11th year. And I was a householder in, the, in a big house for eight of those, nine of those years. And just last year, the community and, and with us, of course, decided to pull us out. So at this point, Mark and I are in our own home um, with our children. Because he, he's just, he works so much at the bakery, and the bakery is in a, t in a town, so it's not in our community, which is what it used to be. So we're, it's, a, it's a, you know, a um, full steam, what do you call it? Business. It's a professional bakery, you know. So uh, that's how we balance it now. And I go in. I go back into um, Sultane, into our community every day, and work from there. But um, the balance is um, is hard because we haven't met that. You know, the it would seem that that was an attempt to give us a little bit more. Um, kind of a solid family life. We had teenage girls, you know, coming in and, and they were not so thrilled at that point. Growing, they loved growing up in community and sharing our table. Our table was huge in it and we really felt that was important that, um, you know, while we were a nuclear family, that the world is really big and that our table is always open. And it's, you know, that our table was really crazy, you know, with lots of people, <laughs> like, you know, 15 people at most meals. Um, 
was a really wonderful way for us, to, I think, to raise our, our kids. But and when they hit the teenage years, I mean, we weren't seeing much of our teenagers down at the table. <laughs> they really needed us back. So it's been great for us to have our family life now. But I think the balance then is, is um, it's a bit off now for me. And I don't know uh, how Mark would feel, but I miss community. And we've spent, we were in JVC, and then after that we were um, in a community in Portland with a bunch of our, with former JVs. And um, so we've always been in community. So this is the first time, and this is our second year outside of community in a, in a physical space where we're not sharing space. So um, the balance is a little better for family life, but that, um, you know, that experience of, yeah, there's, I, I can't um, recommend community living enough because I think in our society, especially in, in such a privileged first world country as our own, that prides itself on, um, you know, consumerism and, and, um, and accelerating all of the things that we need around us. There's nothing like being with others so that, that everything is shared. And not only what you own, but your space. You know, this is not just, you know, quiet time for Mary. Any, anything can be negotiated and has to be communicated. So every day is another chance to meet the other. You either do it well or you do it poorly and the next day you try it again. So isolation for me has never been the answer. It's great to be a family, and we do enough of this <laughs> communicating together, but um, that wider picture of bringing the stranger, and Dorothy Day always said that, you know, you, you, in the Catholic worker movement, at one point in the 30s when they were just beginning, someone suggested that they have applications, you know, maybe we should screen people, you know, who are going to live with us in the workers, in the worker houses. And um, she's like, no way. Whoever comes to us is meant to be with us. Whoever comes in your life, whoever crosses your path, you don't choose that. That you, whoever comes into your world is, is who is meant to be there. And it's your your choice to open your heart to that and accept that or to turn. I think a quick thing to mention would be that when you choose, say, Camp Hill community living, you're giving up the rat race a bit, but your social life obviously intensifies greatly. But that kind of helps with some balance. The financial stress of community living is way less. You still have to do that as a community. But when you're in community, you're sharing resources, and it just seems way easier. It's actually quite amazing. We can say we have no wants. Yeah, but we haven't had a salary for a while. Now, you said you were a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you have time, what you pop up. Yeah, I think, I mean, as I mentioned, something about my heart. <laughs> and that's because I'm a, I tend to be more of a thinker, but there's something like pulling you, restlessness. But I definitely had a desire to, to do something with my hands. I taught theology in a high school. And I loved it. And then at six, after six years, something was pulling me. And then I went to Notre Dame. And that just lasted about a year. I was so pulled, I needed to do something with my hands. And now I know what was being told. That at the time, it was gardening. I wanted a garden, you know, or grow something to the food and garden. And I started making, I had, at Notre Dame, I had this garden. I hung out with uh, the international students that had all these unusual techniques. But yeah, <laughs> something was pulling me. And But that was, you know, we had two kids, and uh, let's just randomly leave our community in Portland, Oregon, we had a nice thing going, actually. And, uh, so it was a bit of a risk. I mean, I would say that's par for the course, too. Definitely go for the risk. <laughs> well, and to do it as a couple, so, sorry, doing it as a couple, and as we mentioned, relationship is a big part of this. Doing it as a couple is an interesting thing, too, and I think there's pretty high divorce rate <laughs> across the board, but when you look at 
social workers or people living alternative lives just as high, if not higher. It's so it's just an interesting thing, you know, the sacrament of marriage and how it applies to doing this kind of thing as a couple. We won't go into our <laughs> tensions, but <laughs> well, I, I was just going to ask you to highlight a little bit more that discernment process because it's a risk for an individual um, to give up what it's sort of conventionally held as, as, you know, the goals of one's life, but what leads, a, you know, even to take the risk of a family, you know, into that? What was the perceived kind of reward of that, you know? You know, I, I, I can say that, um, <clears throat> I'll just make a little bit light of it, but <clears throat> we have a fleet of, um, I don't know, Selchin probably has about 30 cars, or, and, you know, so we have our cars, um, and I drive a nice Honda. I mean, I think it's nice. And my daughter wanted to know why on earth we could not buy a Lexus. Can't we have a Lexus? And, you know, and I just, I, I get excited about them, you know, pursuing their own dreams. But we make it clear that our decision as individuals and as, a, and as their parents, that um, we were committed and always will be committed to a certain lifestyle. So I think that... Um, and I think they also, as, as children, respect us and know that um, because we, are, we have conviction in, in our choices that, um, and that they have everything they need that, and they are, are safe and um, very well educated and, you know, and very well loved that they have all their, their needs, we think, met. But... Um, yeah, I I think that what was your, what was your question? How to discern. How to yeah, discern. I think that the discernment was. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that both Mark and I. I mean, I speak for myself that there just wasn't ever any question that I preferred the risk. I preferred the unconventional. I preferred. Um, to see through what I knew others were, um, were that, that other, that other, for me, the choices that were made by others and that may have been pushed on me were just not for me. And I always, and I still continue, with an unshakable faith that we are fine. And we will always have what we need. And we always have had what we need, if not too much. So there is a, yeah, a, a deep and knowing um, faith that yeah, we I, have what we need. I, I, yeah, it's an interesting question because it's how do you, I think you, because the, the temptation, if it's temptation or the pulls to like worry about money or even after college going to the Jesuit Volunteer Corps to live simply and everything and, you know, my older brother's, shouldn't you go get a job now? I'm sure lots of people hear that kind of, there's an expectation of society and possibly parents to like succeed in that way, you know? And, uh, you know, really by ruining your life by maybe studying particular saints or Jesuit volunteer corps or having heroes who radically do something, whether it's Dorothy Day or some of the examples you guys talk about, you know, and once that's in you, can if, if you honestly ask to, to pursue a path like that, in an inner, this is about inner work. I mean, either you do inner work or you don't, and none of us can critique the other. It's all on you, man. And so either you're doing it or not, and it's, it's not really going to matter to me. It's like if you want to go that direction, once you ask, then, and then you're, it's scary because then you're stuck, you know. Once you ask for mystical experience, that's actually a painful path. I mean, when you're philosophizing about it, it's like, oh, you know, you're up in these upper echelons, and it's all about tension and leading you to more difficult places. But your strength, you know, it's to trust that you'll have enough strength as soon as, because it's going to fog out. Every choice will fog out, and you won't be able to see why you're doing it. And, you know, we run into that all the time. Why are we doing this? And then, you know, then you might choose the next thing and keep going. And then it clears up and goes back, and that's constant, you know, so. 
you know, I, I guess I just want to make clear that our choice is our choice. You know, I know, um, of course, many professionals uh, who've chosen conventional paths or mainstream paths. Um, uh, you know, a good friend that is a doctor that is that there's just no question that she's doing what she needs to do and that she's she's pursuing what she's meant to do. It's so interesting to come back to the gospel reading, and I, I just never thought about it this way before until you read it, was that the workers were paid that only worked an hour the same as those that had been there forever, right? So whenever you get to your heart's desire, or wherever you get to what your purpose is in life, or you know, Mark's aha moment where you have clinched in with, with your archetype, God will reward you for, for showing up. You know, they came late. Man, they must have been 55 years old, you know, and they finally found what it is that, that God was asking them to do, and the payment was the same. They could have, and that's how I interpret it today, and I've never interpreted that before. You know, you could be 70 years old and it just, you know, consistently followed the path that others wanted for you, or that you thought was the way to go, or that someone else told you to do, and ignored all of that inner longing. But at 70, you finally said, screw it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it now, and, and you will be rewarded, <laughs> and it will be the same. Yeah. International. There's over a hundred in the world. So if you want to go to Germany, if you want to go to India, if you want to go to Africa, you want to go to Norway, Sweden, Scotland, Ireland, England, Canada. There's a place for you. But we have some, we'll pass at the end. We'll pass out. We have some it's information. It's a great option. I mean, of course, we we're biased to JVC, but we know lots of JVC is also international. We love it because they're really founded on those, you know, what was really solid for us as far as, um, you know, choice to, after that time. But JV, or, uh, Camp Hill will also do the same. That's a total option for the gap year. Uh, not gap year, you're already in school. For, um, you know, or before you go to graduate school or whatever, to go spend a year or two in Camp Hill. Because, yeah, it'll just totally spank you, <laughs> there's a, so much work, you know, and, and you will work like you've never worked before. Yeah. Um, I know that you mentioned uh, a brother, like, saying something when he went off to do JVC, and I was wondering if you had experienced, like, any other conflicts, like, with family or friends um, who had, like, challenged you in your discernment process when this is something that you were so passionate about, um, but maybe somebody very close to you kind of challenged you or said something that, like, made you take a pause at what you're doing and, like, what that looks like? I think they, people stop. Once you hit late 30s, <laughs> they give up on you, you know. Uh, you know, an interesting thing, though, is because Mary especially grew up Catholic, and then I pursued Catholicism more um, during college, but Camp Hill was not Catholic. It is kind of founded on Christian traditions. It appreciates those rhythms and uh, so, probably for Mary Moore, the, the going to something that's not a Catholic foundation, got, people were worried about that. And because Camp Hill can come from a philosophy that's more esoteric, and I don't want to start going into that, but <laughs> it gets, you know, that can get pretty wild. And we have, you know, maintained the best we can continuing <laughs> somewhat our Catholic journey and that has gone up and down too. So anyways, the Camp, the camp Hill impulse is, I don't know about you guys as you're hearing about it for the first time now, but when we heard about it, it's like, how could I never have heard about such a cool thing like that before? So it's kind of this hidden thing. It's still strange that people don't know because there's no doubt that if you saw the effects of the Camp Hill work, you'd just be like, Jeez, why isn't everybody doing this? And, and for the folks that we're working with, it, that's where you, it's just like they're living real lives of dignity, like the guys that are working with me. So why wouldn't everybody want to do that kind of thing? And, and yet it's hidden. So I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know why it's hidden. But anyways, people were nervous about us being a part of this hidden thing. I think that, yeah, I, to answer your question um, for myself, yeah, we, 
we hit up against um, some questions from probably nobody was really direct with us. Um, but we were married. We had two kids when we left for Camp Hill. JVC was a you know a no brainer. You know that was really laudable. I mean, nobody was opposing us doing a year of service, especially when there was an AmeriCorps award. You know now that there is, we didn't have that. But <laughs> but we looked into Marino before. This. That's true. So now that was all fine if you just did it for a year, and then you know you get on with what you're supposed to do. So when we, we did that, I went to grad school, but we, you know, then we, then we ended up working. We worked for like normal people <laughs> for about eight years. And then that, you know, when he decided, when Mark decided to go to, to Notre Dame and then got really antsy. Um, and then we just sprung it on people that we were moving to you know, upstate New York to this community, you know. Where they, they hand like, milk the cows, no, no machine. We were like, they were like, okay, uh, how long are you going to do that for? And we were like, well, we'll just do it, you know, for a year. And then we'll come back to our house in Portland. We rented the house out. But then we stayed, this is the 11th year. We've just never gone back. So people are stopped asking, I think, because we're fine. You know, we're fine. Um, one thing I'm curious about is how the impact on this community and this kind of uh, philosophy or way of living has uh, impacted your girls and, and Leo. Um, even the education they come out of versus like conventional education. Like what are, what have you witnessed there? Well, the first thing that I'll say is that, I mean, we, because we lived in these, the, these houses the way we did with three meals a day, formal meals, like set tables and uh, it's part of the rhythm of the life, you know, with 14 people at the table. And uh, our kids got to learn organically about diversity. And so, you know, when you get, they, they don't get nervous around people that look different. And every time you see it, it's like, oh, like that's the one reward we can say as a, as a family, you know. That, but now uh, that they're teenagers, they get irritated or annoyed. At, the, at our folks, you know, at, at, but not out, not out of any kind of fear. <laughs> it's like pure relationship, you know, that, she, that Ruth knows Birga is just going to talk loud, you know. So she's like, you just quiet, you know. So she's just very, they're very personable. It's, it's a, it's it's a relationship. normal thing. It's, it's, you know, just as irritating as she would be with you know, anyone. It's not because of their differentness. Um, they're starting to rebel a little bit to the, because it's all pretty natural living, kind of. They'll call it hippie, I guess, but they're starting to like want to know what the rest of the world's doing, like wanting the nicer car or whatever. But it's the same with the work that I work with my hands in that way and physically. I, I have this dream that they'll join me, right? And I'm not sure they will, you know. They're, they'll probably, ex you know, like. They'll explore some other direction. I don't know. But there's got to be this deeper impact happening. I mean, yeah, it's hard to say. Well, I mean, I have no doubt about it that they're, you know, because Mark mentioned Steiner, um, one of his offshoots, of course, was education as well as, as the pyramid, the Camp Hill movement, many, many other things, medicine and biodynamics. But Waldorf education is um, based on anthroposophy, and so our children have always been educated in the Waldorf system, and so uh, since they were, you know, nursery. So Ruthie's now in the in the Waldorf High School, um, and they and that's a whole other, you know, you Google that and you'll go to a whole other world. So um, there are no computers. There's no. Um, they make all their textbooks. Everything is working with your hand and your heart and your mind. So it's seeing the whole person, the whole child. They have a class teacher all the way through first through eighth grade. So the education system is very um, holistic and um, it's very deep into the person and, and in, the, in the individual. They've never been tested. You know, and Ruthie's now in high school, so she's getting tested now. Um, but there, it's not. There's no standard that they are meeting. And so the children, I think, um, 
they are definite individuals. They're strong-minded young women, the two older girls. Um, yeah, they've definitely been taught to think, to critically think, to question, to um, investigate, and um, you know we've been exposed to them to a pretty atypical world. Um, they have what they need. You know, it's not like they don't now. This year, since we're out, we have a TV, but this is the first time we've had a TV in our whole married life. So our kids now have cable, and I say every day, why do we have cable, you know, but they don't look at it that much, but they haven't had any of these things, and so um, the girls are, we're seeing as they are becoming young women, yeah, that they're powerful. I think that they're strong, and I think they are, their eyes are pretty wide open, yeah, I hope. Any final questions? You know, there's so many, you know, there, we're all like from one light, you know, you'll get me started talking about, you know, all of our different personalities, but um, community is just the way it, 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 we are in community, so you're either going to name it or you're not, or you're either going to include yourself in it or you're not, you know, you look at any street in New York City and that's just a, you know, a huge community of people, so you're either isolated or you're connected. But, you know, community living for us, we've always said the benefit of Camp Hill is that we're not, that because we're mixed in with atypical people um, and children and all kinds of, of different folks, that they are padding. If we had to, if it were just, you know, a bunch of intellect, intellectuals working together, uh, we'd kill each other. And, and it, we, the fact that we have so many, so much diversity really helps our work. The community comes in so many different forms. I mean, you, you build community no matter where you are, and you must build community. You, you have to know your neighbor. It's imperative that you know your neighbor and that you ask the question, that you have interest in the other, that you go you know, next door and you, you knock. And it doesn't matter what form the community takes. For us, it's you know, pretty unusual, but you all build it, and you must build it. So it you know doesn't matter if you're in corporate you know Citibank in the 45th floor. You know if your eyes are not open to your neighbor, then yeah, you just create an isolated world that is lonely, and the loneliness will always be with you, always be with you. So yeah, it's a great question, and, and I mean it doesn't matter who you are that we need each other and that we're connected. So you either connect yourself you know through your brain you know, make that connection logically, or you do it with your heart and your hands. So yeah, it, it takes awakeness, you know, being conscious. And you said that in the beginning.